Hey everyone, welcome to Journey to the West. I'm Jay and I'm joined here with Sen. Hey everyone, I'm Sen. Along with returning guest, Ja. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Ja. And today we're going to talk about a pretty loaded topic. The overarching theme is going to be the sexual exploitation of Asian women. And we're going to contextualize that in a way that we haven't done before through the framework of how uh, cultural violence, systemic violence, and direct violence are all connected and intertwined and feed each other. So we're going to start with some current events. Recently, this made Asian Twitter news. There's this restaurant in Atlanta, Georgia, which is, if you're not familiar, the southeastern coast of the USA. It's a Viet restaurant called We Suki Suki, which already by the name tells you a lot. And uh, for seven years, they got away with running a business that had an overtly racist concept, including but not limited to theme nights called Good Morning Vietnam. They're basically based on uh, war films glorifying the, the Vietnam War. Uh, they sold napalm smoothies. They would serve banh mi with machetes, and they would use an ammo box for cash. Uh, seven years. What is it with white people wanting to fucking cosplay imperialists, murderers, and rapists? <laughs> and what is just so fucking irresistible about making fun of war crimes? Uh, Sen had a really good thread, basically eviscerating this place, and I would like for her to elaborate on that because it was it was so good. Uh... <laughs> All right. Um, the place was also run by, I think there were a couple, I didn't know at the time, but he did say something about having Asian wives. So, um, the restaurant's run by this Vietnamese woman named um, uh, Quinn Chen and this other white guy. And he was the one mm. that posted all this fucking trash online. And... The original image had the menu with, like, the napalm smoothie thing. And the there was another image of this white guy in some kind of army gear with a machete and captioned, time to play. And I just couldn't help but think, oh, God, is this some kind of, like, time to play, time to go rape? Some people, like, fucking all the soldiers did back in the day. I saw someone who had reported on this restaurant like ages ago um, saying that, oh, like uh, Quinn Jin, oh, she goes by the name Q, by the way. So Q was like, oh, she's such a great person. She's so nice, blah, blah, blah. And like she got the name idea of like we um, uh, ski ski or suki suki, which means like I love love or we love love because she – got the keys to the restaurant on valentine's day or some bullshit like that and i'm just like what the fuck is this weird like it sounds so reminiscent of me love you long time like bullshit and he was trying to like rebuff all of the sort of um criticism by saying that oh it's just a pun it's just it's like pound of whiskey you know because you know we ski ski is like kind of sounds like that another bullshit because there was like a chinese british actor who called mm. him out on it named um daniel yorklo and they were just going back and forth and he was just so arrogant and up his own fucking ass about it like he was saying that oh you guys are just mad the thousands of people that are just mad at me, you're just mad that I'm untouchable. And he's like, oh, even if I apologize, what's the point? You'll still be mad at me anyway. As if apologies are contingent on 
Mm. how the other person accepts Mm -hmm. or treats you afterwards. That's not what apologies are about. They're not about your own fucking ego. And also, I, I made the thread just talking about more shitty racist restaurants. Like we mentioned like a year ago about this establishment in wait was it in south australia oh anyway um it was about hotel long time also run by a vietnamese woman named tin uh chu uh and alex fai as you can tell they they feigned ignorance on the long time reference as if they don't know where that fucking phrase came from which was um full metal jacket like where the fuck do people use long time in this way like they were just pretending like oh it's not what it means but it was also another shitty war th- uh, themed restaurant and then there was like I-, I dug up like an old tweet from a user named um at d underscore um 25 s and he was just listing all these um same kind of establishments where they glorified wartime vietnam in Melbourne and for those of you who don't know what Melbourne's like, it's supposed it's one of like the most major cities in Australia. It's very big epicenter mm. for Asians in terms of population. It's supposed to be this like green hippie, uh, we're so liberal, we voted the Green Party in, like, you know, all that bullshit, progressive bullshit. And they have fucking restaurants also co owned by fucking Vietnamese people called like Hanoi Hana um saigon sally which they called oh the slightly more mature yet promiscuous sister of saigon sally because they were sister restaurants hoi chi mama which had like a good morning vietnam martini or some bullshit like that uh it's just so much but it's not just white people doing this i mean i think there was another establishment called rice queen uh, run by uh, Lucky Papadopoulos, which um, he might be oh. Greek, I believe. That, yeah, that sounds Greek. And um, so, yeah, he called his fucking place Rice Queen. And this is just Melbourne. This is not just like, oh, like I had to go searching far and wide to find all these racist restaurants. This is just in one fucking city. It's just so weird and fucked, like how we we tend to brand Vietnamese food in like, what do white people know about Vietnam? The war. So sadly, we just start putting all this fucking war imagery and not just war imagery, but fetishizing it and like putting all this like weird, like lurid type of imagery up and it's fucking insulting. And I don't know why people keep doing this, but it's a trend. And I feel like a lot of Vietnamese people internalize this orientalist view of uh, the v- the Vietnam War and who we are as a people. And we're not just defined by the war. It is a big part of um, the refugee story and how we are as people, how we came to be in a lot of these like um, Western countries as um, diaspora and everything. But I just find it so fucked that we, ha- we still have to do this. Um, but yeah, this was a rant. Uh, was there anything else you wanted me to mention about that? Uh, well, to add to the shit pile, this one isn't specifically Viet, but it's a pan-Asian restaurant that was brought to my attention on Twitter. Somebody commented on the, that thread, actually. And it's located in Dubai. Uh, it's called Mr. Miyagi's. And let's see. Apart from the excruciatingly painful puns on Asian food. They also have really questionable decor. For instance, the bathrooms are labeled lady and boy. The wait staff is Mm -hmm. made to dress in schoolgirl uniforms, like Japanese schoolgirls. So yeah, very overtly racist. And this restaurant actually won an award for its concept. Uh, I looked up who owned it. It's actually a British company. They have a generalized photo of their staff 
on their About Us page, and it's mostly white men, white women, and Asian women. And like the four leaders of that organization are three white men and one South Asian woman. So very proudly contributing to this racist bullshit, trying to make money off caricatures of Asian people. Uh, I know we were initially talking about Viet's, but this shit is so endemic and so widespread that nobody is thinking twice before doing this. Which to me says that this kind of racism is so normalized that society just accepts it. It, it doesn't see a problem with it. That's why the shit has been allowed to go on for so long. That's why it keeps popping up. That's why we keep have to calling this shit out because there aren't enough consequences for this kind of behavior. Um, I'd also like to point out that Dubai is a very like big sort of tourist area. A lot of expats there. I, I mean, I have to say it's infested with white people, so... It's like a place where they probably don't care about like cultural insensitivities because, you know, white people don't give a shit, even even though like, what, how are they awarded <laughs> like award for this bullshit? What the fuck? Oh my god. I mean, you, you mentioning that this is a hub for expats kind of explains it all because like they're catering to each other. Mm -hmm. So obviously they're not going to see a problem with it. Yeah. Uh, so to further th along this discussion, why is this shit so normalized? Well, let's dive in to the history of sexual exploitation of Asian women. Oh boy, there is a lot to unpack. Uh, there is actually too much that we could talk about to squeeze into a tiny 30-minute podcast, but we did want to briefly talk about the history of sexual imperialism as well as the complicity of Asians and Asian governments in perpetuating it. And this was mostly inspired by something I also came across on Twitter. Somebody wrote up a thread explaining an article that was talking about how the Republic of Korea was actually facilitating sex trafficking to U.S. soldiers on bases in Korea. So I, I think we're probably well aware of the concept of comfort women. And often it's in the context of World War II and Japan conquering a lot of Asia and taking women from the Philippines, from China, from Korea, and making them basically sex slaves to service their frontline soldiers. Uh, what isn't talked about a lot of the time is that once this practice ended, once Japan kind of washed its hands of this system, the system didn't fall apart. It, the ownership just changed hands. So. These women were then owned by uh, basically the U.S. military and uh, also local governments. Uh, I want to briefly mention what was happening in the Philippines around that time, more post World War II in the '60s, because uh, the Philippines had just gained what I would consider nominal independence from the United States. Uh, a lot of U.S. bases in the Philippines and also throughout Asia, really, if you look at it, they sponsor or created this, this need for comfort women, for prostitution. So around these bases sprung up entire cottage industries of uh, women sex workers who service these GIs. And it was to the point that uh, 
local healthcare providers who are Filipino, by the way, were actually screening these women for diseases, like venereal disease, and uh, sending photos of the ones who didn't pass these tests to the bases so that the men could avoid these women. So rather than trying to stop a practice that is obviously completely exploitive and imperialist, they were basically working with the oppressor. They didn't do anything to stop it. Uh, drawing parallels to what happened in South Korea, the South Korean government actually aided in creating a set of regulations for sex workers whose entire livelihoods depended upon business from guys in the surrounding bases. So like you would have a military base and then the area immediately around it is full of bars and like camp towns where these women who were basically exiles for being sex workers were living. Uh, a combination of the reason why they were in this position, uh, one left over from the war, and like you can't find real work after that because of the social stigma, even if the shit was not willing, like even if you went into this and forced forced to go into this and it wasn't something that you chose to do, society wouldn't accept you because you were basically seen as used up. So there's one, one part of it. Another part is that um, women were actually being recruited to service these people as an economic, like a, a source of revitalizing the economy after the war, especially after the Korean War. Like the only resources that Korea had were their bodies. So uh, I remember talking to somebody before and they mentioned that, you know, the, the whole hair industry, wigs, that's all, all that you had was to sell your body. So women would cut their hair and sell it, uh, but also they would be selling sex. And unfortunately, this practice never really ended. Uh, around the 90s, the, there was an economic upturn in Korea. And so a lot of these women were able to kind of phase out of this work, but they were easily replaced by the next wave of women uh, who were mostly Filipina, as well as some Russian and like Eastern European or Eurasian women as well. And a lot of them were trafficked. So to understand why this was happening, it's not like, you know, they're, they're going around in vans and kidnapping women off the street, right? This is a predatory practice promising women who are destitute and poor that they have opportunities here. So like, hey, come to Korea. Um, we have these auditions, so you need to record yourself singing because we're looking for entertainers to come to Korea on this special visa, which, by the way, the government had created specifically for sex work because it requires that you get tested for STDs. Uh, but these women don't know. And, you know, if you have kids to feed and you're desperate, and uh, up until 2015, about 26% of the Philippines was in poverty living in poverty. So that's the reality of one out of every four people that you meet doesn't have enough money to put a roof over their head or feed their family. So like when you're desperate, you fucking do what you can. You hustle to make sure that your family can survive. And that's why about 10% of the Philippine GDP is being con like contributed by overseas Filipino workers. And like that's its own deal. That, you know, a lot of us get exploited when we work overseas. And it's it's everywhere. It's not just in the West. It's also in other Asian countries, in uh, the Middle East, 
basically anywhere where we're not citizens, we don't have the same rights. So, you know, we get framed for murder, we get raped and murdered. <laughs> we, all kinds of violence. We endure. And so a lot of these women are being exploited and they're brought into a trafficking ring. They're promised, you know, we'll get you the entertainment job. You can just like perform at these bars, blah, 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 and you'll make this amount of money and uh, you'll be able to send this much back home. It'll be great. And then when they get there, it's not what they were told it was. Um, when they get there, they're basically like go go girls. They're made to service uh, GIs, uh, often foreigners. Uh, if they don't make a certain amount of quota for the night, then they get charged a fine for not making the establishment enough money. And so, in order to make up that difference and pay off that debt, they actually they have to basically sleep with these men. Uh, a lot of the money that they were promised would be given to them was not. It doesn't go to them. It goes to the establishment. It goes to the people who are running these rings and pimping them out. And a lot of women think that they can get out of this by marrying a GI. That, you know, if we're married, then this can save me from this shitty life. But it doesn't work. So about 80% of these marriages to GIs fail because most of the time, you know, they get married, sometimes they even have kids. And then once the GI's tour of duty is over, he goes back to America and you never see him again because he doesn't give a shit because he doesn't see you as a person anyway. And you're, so you're stuck with a kid and the social stigma of being a whore for your government. <laughs> Uh, and you're fucked. And then society hates you. So you still have to live in that area around the base, and you you don't leave that lifestyle. Um, yeah, it's fucked up. I'm sure I'm missing a lot of shit because I'm just saying this off the top of my head from the articles that I've read. Um, I actually do remember, like, because I was reading a lot of history, um, I think the government back home really did not want to encourage any actual legitimate recognition of these relationships. So they would discourage a lot of these GIs from actually getting married um, because, you know, a lot of people didn't look very favorably, favorably on interracial marriage. So a lot of the men were actually encouraged to be like, hey, you can have these women as your, like, quote unquote, like temporary wives or like a have a temporary relationship with this woman while you're there, but, like, when you get back, it's, you know, you know, done. They do have things like the War Brides Act, which did facilitate um, some of these, like, uh, relationships. But, again, as Jay mentioned, a lot of them didn't do very well because I think from what I've been reading, a lot of the GIs that did go through the with the marriage between, like, their, you know, Asian War Bride thingy, they weren't very well off. A lot of them were usually living in poverty most of the time. Uh, so a lot of these marriages weren't exactly an escape or an idyllic type of resolution. I, w I do remember um, there was an article talking about the comfort woman issue and how like very politically charged it is because a lot of the narrative around the comfort women have has been controlled and sanctioned by the Korean government and a lot of the the nonprofit orgs um an example an example would be um one of the first like comfort women to come out which her name was um Kim Haksun uh she was the model for the San Francisco Comfort uh, Woman statue and she had talked about in detail how she got into the industry and she was sold by her foster father to China with some other girl mm -hmm. 
Um, but the interesting thing is they omitted a lot of the part where she was actually sold by her own foster father and kind of, you know, glorified, embellished the whole narrative of the evil Japanese, which let's not deny that they played a huge part in the oppression and the exploitation of these women. But the most the most evident thing is that they want to continue a sort of narrative of good and evil, a dichotomy, so to speak. And it conveniently leaves out the complicity of um, Korean men and the government allowing these institutionalization of sex work and also the U.S. part that they played. Um, there was also another story of another woman named um, Yi yong Su. She had talked about her abduction, like her abduction and how she had escaped with a friend from that an establishment where she was doing sex work. And later she revised her story to say that she was abducted by Japanese uh, soldiers or something. Um, and there were um, two women who have written kind of contrarian sort of uh, story about the comfort women issue. One of them's name uh, Pak Yu Ha from Sejong University and uh, Sarah Sa from San Francisco uh, State University. And both of their books have not been well received it, from the Korean government or media. Um, Sarah Sa, Sa, I think, she has not had her book translated. And Pak Yu Ha, she was actually taken to court um, for her book. And she was fined like uh, 90 million won, which is, I think, equivalent to 74,000 US dollars. And the prosecutors also wanted to press um, three years of prison, which. I don't want to get into like the legal system over there, but some rapists and murderers get a lot less than that. So it was pretty uh, shit. And also going back to the whole government thing, uh, a lot of the comfort women who have spoken out, you know, the survivors who have like talked about how their own countrymen sold them have been silenced. Um, there was an Asian women's fund um, in 1994, I think, by Japan, where they try to compensate women. And 34 out of the 46 surviving women took the money, and they have been not even mentioned in the media. No one's even like asked them about anything because they took the money. Whereas the other women who didn't take the money, they were like, you know, put on a pedestal and paraded around for mm. an agenda of sorts. So. Yeah. Uh, there's some kind of saying about politics that, like, never let a good tragedy go to waste. And I feel like that is very descriptive of what happened with comfort women in Korea. Uh, something I wanted to add to that one of the articles that I was using as my source is by or from Politico. So we're going we're gonna to post as many sources as we can in the description. But there's this really good quote that I think sums it up very well. Um, South Korean government documents show male officials strategizing to encourage GIs to spend their money on women in Korea rather than Japan during leave time. Officials ordered classes in basic English and etiquette to encourage women to sell themselves more effectively and earn more money. And there's this quote from a former sex worker named Aaron Kim, who says, they urged us to sell as much as possible to the GIs, praising us as dollar-earning patriots. Our government was one big pimp for the U.S. military. So, yeah, the next time you talk about the sexual exploitation of Asian women, uh, obviously the primary uh, culprit is white sexual imperialism. Basically, the, the attitude that white men can have Asian women because we're objects and they're entitled to our bodies. But let's not forget the complicity of Asian governments in basically selling us out 
because I think a lot of people ignore that. I mean, we're obviously knowing us, we're not here to push the narrative of like the the evil patriarchal Asian man. We're here to make sure there's accountability where it's due. Yeah, I remember there was this like old thread from Ask a Korean where there was a whole like BTS thing about ugh, I forget. Oh yeah, it was, I like, remember that. Some, one of the members named Jimin, he had like the Hiroshima bombing on like a shirt or some shit. And like Oscar Korea made a whole fucking trash ash ass thread about how Japan deserved to get <sighs> bombed. And I like I was trying to find that thread. I think it's deleted. I, I do have a screenshot though of one of the comments, but he he was making it sound like, oh yeah, Japan deserved everything because of their imperialism and um annexation of Korea. And it's not justified either way. Obviously, the atrocities need to be accounted for and, you know, recognized. But it was just so shitty how he didn't even bring America into the mix of how they fucking, like, helped it along. They, instead of dismantling it, they were like, hey, this is good. Mm-hmm. I'll take it. I'll take these fucking brothels for myself. And like rape Asia because that's what I do, and he didn't even he didn't even mention any of that. He was just making this like demonic Japanese thing narrative. So I'm just pissed off that if you're gonna really talk um, for the survivors and talk about history, make sure you cover all your bases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because it always feels incomplete whenever somebody talks about it because they have this this agenda, as we mentioned before, to absolve whoever they care for from blame. Like if you want to have an honest conversation, you have to really, really call out everybody who was involved because they all played a part and they are all responsible. And refusing to acknowledge that doesn't allow us to move forward. Now, something I also wanted to add, uh, because so many of the discussions about this topic are so broken and fractured, and there are a lot of false attitudes, uh, especially as we've mentioned, the absolving of blame of governments, especially of Western imperialists. But there's also this attitude that I've seen crop up as well, that Asian women are basically asking for it when they get raped and murdered, as though it is completely our fault that we are stereotyped this way. But like, obviously, if you understand the history, it's hell of a lot more complex than that. And uh, I think Ja had something to add specifically about the nature of sexual imperialism, what that entails, and how that really informs the way that we construct gender, especially when we apply it to issues like this. Sexual imperialism that partly rooted in this idea of the West being dominant or masculine um, and the East being submissive or feminine. And I think this is a core of Mm -hmm. Orientalism, if I remember correctly. But I think if you're familiar with how white people, and specifically, I guess, Western cultures construct gender. So, um, for example, Men wanting to please women, this idea that women are lower in status, intelligence, or ability, or or even how like women are, you know, like infantilized, or or that they don't deserve like equal respect or equal rights. And I, if you sort of observe that, and how gender is applied to the East and the West, you know, specifically that. And the idea like the you know the east being feminine, the west being mas- uh, masculine, I feel like it shouldn't be surprising that it allows for this narrative of the east, you know in this case Asia to exist. And I feel like that narrative only gets amplified for Asian women in particular because um it sort of pushes forth this idea that that the East wants or needs to be dominated or controlled by the 
the West were just seen as powerful. And, and I think that, you know, being Asian, you get subjected to Orientalism. And I think on top of that, you know, being a woman and also being subjected to sexism, I feel like that only further adds to the racial oppression of Asian women. I guess I also want to add that building up on what Jay and Sen brought up about the exploitation of Asian men, I mean, excuse me, Asian women by white men. Uh, I feel like, and I guess like tying this in with um, Orientalism, which is used to dehumanize and other people. Yeah, and you know, which people often do, especially during times of war. But um, I feel like it is, it makes it e- easier for people to um, inflict harm, you know, exploit them and assert power over them and also justify them. Uh, I'd also like to add, there was this interesting little YouTube video on like LGBT um, in Vietnam. And they did mention during the Indochina era where the French, the French colonized Southeast Asia, which included Vietnam, a lot of the fucking colonizers at the time weren't too interested in Vietnamese women because a lot of us at the time painted our teeth black and, you know, looked very foreign and not exotic enough for them to want to go rape. So Mm -hmm. at the time, there was also um, opium, the opium wars, opium drugs coming into Vietnam. So a lot of the Vietnamese men who were like, you know, addicted to opium at the time and working for the French colonizers were, you know, routinely raped while they were um, drugged up. And a lot of the Vietnamese men were, you know, put into brothels and became prostitutes to serve white men. So to extend the whole feminization of the East and of Asians, it's also to emasculate and literally rape Asia, (laughs) if you want to put it in the most crude of ways. Rape and genocide. Right. I was. I remember reading um, this thing again. There was like a a senator from the U.S. who said that Saigon was like a literal brothel for America. Like this was not some kind of like kept secret. Like it, people eventually knew what it was. War mm-hmm. has a lot to do with power, and rape is power. And. Uh- Coming back to the idea that uh, this Orientalism, this othering, and this feminization of Asia as a whole it affects all of us. And th- that just kind of reminds me, it's so important for us to remember that, to remember what community is and what that means. Because community is more than the space that you occupy as an individual. And I feel that just thinking about how fractured our diaspora community is, there are a lot of people in online spaces who care more about their individual needs than community. And this goes for, like, everybody. Community doesn't mean only one half of us. Right, because this shit affects all of us, albeit in slightly different ways ways because of uh, gender. But I feel that we can't move forward until we acknowledge that this is something that does indeed affect all of us. Because otherwise, we're just kind of co-evolving this very warped sense of identity. And a morality that only applies to us personally and kind of justifies other people to do the exact same thing. So it's really important for us to not have the attitude that we're asking for it when we experience racism. 
Right. Even though it's a, it is in some ways a natural reaction to our complicity historically in our own oppression. That doesn't mean that you fix the problem by not seeing us as people anymore. You know, because community is not about you. It's about all of us. And sometimes I see an attitude that kind of paints the way that Asian women are treated in Western society as better, like marginally better than the way that Asian men are treated. And this is really something that is missing in the whole picture. If you've listened to anything that we've ever talked about in this podcast, especially this one, you would know that that's not actually true. The amount of direct violence that Asian women also experience at the hands of white men is uh, insane. I mean, do people who share stories about Asian women getting murdered by white men understand that, like, we're the ones getting killed? And how fucking inappropriate it is to say, oh, I don't feel sympathy for this person because she she deserved it because she willingly went with this guy. It, it, and it's so pervasive to the point that even women who are abducted and killed and who are, like, happy with their own families <laughs> are accused of asking for it when they get killed. And it needs to stop. Yeah, if you don't have anything great or productive to say, you don't have you don't want to share your condolences. Shut the fuck up, all right? Go go wank by yourself about this fucking hell. Yeah, it's it's fine if you can't offer like if you really can't dredge up any kind of sympathy for a person who was killed out of like the fact that this is violence based on white sexual imperialism, and that is a bad thing. Like, if you can't bring yourself to fight that, right? If your only response to that is, well, sucks to be you, fuck you, uh, don't say anything at all because you're making shit worse. And the reality of being an Asian woman in a Western society means that even if we aren't 100% aware of the danger that that we are physically in by by living here we know on some subconscious level what this is about right we we know even if we don't know uh there are studies that show that children as young as the age of 3 understand what race is and they know to assign different racial traits because they know what that shit means. A child as young as three, just growing up in this society, being steeped in media, taking social cues from the people around them. So it's not that far-fetched for us to feel what society thinks of us and to internalize it and to also suffer from that. Right. Uh, what inspired me to mention this is that a friend of mine brought up something very interesting. She said that since learning a lot and educating herself about imperialism, colonialism, and the atrocities of anti Asian racism, She's been having a lot more bad dreams lately, nightmares, in which she's being chased by white men, and by, they're very violent. Uh, and so she was asking, has anybody else experienced things like this? And at first I was like, well, I don't really remember my dreams. But you know, I do remember having this dream a while back before I even knew any of the things that I knew today or that I know now that um yeah I'm I'm always being chased by white people um specifically white men and I've also had a dream in which I was 
raped by a white man. And like, it was very disturbing to me at the time. And I didn't understand why, because like, what in my personal life would, would inspire this kind of thing? But then I started talking with other people and they also shared their experiences that even before understanding anti-Asian racism or the way that Asian women were treated in Western society, they too had dreams about being raped and uh, violently sexually assaulted by white men. And I'd like to open it up for any other Asian women listening to this. Has this happened to you too? Have you noticed this? Because to me, even though, you know, this is a small sample size, it seems like we already understand the way that society treats us and thinks of us and views us, even if we don't really know why. Uh, did anybody else want to add something else? I'm sorry. I just got kind of emotional. It's okay. So I need to like breathe. <laughs> I don't even know how to close this. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, um, if any of you guys feel comfortable, you can, you know, DM us on Twitter if you don't feel like sharing this type of thing or um, anyone that's in contact with us, you can DM us about this type of thing. But uh, if you do feel like sharing, we'd, we'd really like to hear from you. But anyway, if we all got, is that all we got for today? Yeah, yeah I think so. This was a, a bit long, so we apologize. But it is, I think it's worth hearing everything. So yeah, um, thanks everyone for listening. Um, hope to see you guys next time. Bye. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye.